Welcome to Feed, a food systems podcast presented by Table. I'm Matthew Kessler. And I'm Samara Brock. Today we speak with Dr. Chana Prakash, who is Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Tuskegee University in Alabama in the United States, and also a professor of crop genetics, biotechnology, and genomics. The real reason why Vandana Shiva and green peas are opposed to golden rice is not because they're worried that it is going to be a failure, but they are worried because it's going to be a success. Chana Prakash received his master's and bachelor's in the field of agriculture and genetics in India, his PhD in Australia in forestry and genetics, and has now been serving on the Tuskegee University faculty since 1989. This is the first time we're saying this, but Chana has a very active Twitter account, at AgBioWorld where he describes himself as a professor and biotech guru who's curious about science, farming, food security, innovation, plants, history. Come for the dog, cat videos, but stay for the science. Chana has dedicated his life to his research and advocacy on the genetic improvement of food crops that are important to developing countries and enhancing societal awareness of food biotechnology issues across the world. He serves as the editor-in-chief of the journal GM Crops, runs the Ag Bio World Foundation, which aims to provide science-based information on agricultural biotechnology issues, and has been personally commended by Norman Barlog, one of the founders of the Green Revolution. As we continue our series exploring power in the food system, we speak with Chana about who decides what ends up on our table. We ask him about his personal story as it connects to the Green Revolution, and we unpack how he sees ideology as getting in the way of science. We also talk with him about his view on golden rice and different efforts to promote organic farming across South Asia in order to better understand how he approaches contested food systems debates. But before that, we learn how from very early on in China's life, he was interested in agriculture. My grandfather on my father's side uh, was an agricultural officer who started a, an agribusiness company after he retired. And so I used to speak spend my summers with him uh, in the rural area of India where he was doing his business, which involved um, meeting, you know, dozens and dozens of farmers going to a lot of little dirt roads and going to the villages. And and so I, I presume that is what got me in, interested in agriculture. And then, of course, it's also that I couldn't get into any other in India that, you know, everybody wants their children to go to become a doctor or engineer. And my my <laughs> grades were too poor to get into either of those, and agriculture was it. What turned me on into plant breeding and genetics was a really a lecture by Norman Borlaug. He kind of came around across India in the mid seventies when I was a, a, an undergraduate student, and uh, he was fairly well known, not necessarily a household name. He was well recognized within the scientific circles, and I remember. Growing up in the 60s when there was uh, an impending famine in India because uh, were two years of successive crops were failures because of drought. The United States sent massive amounts of food aid at that time. This was part of a global food aid program that was signed into law by the United States President Dwight Eisenhower in 1954 as a way for the U.S. to send agricultural supplies to countries experiencing food shortages. This policy has been both praised and criticized over the last 60 years. Those who are critical cite that exporting surplus foods undercuts the market price and makes it difficult for domestic producers to compete. China, his family, and millions of others have also directly benefited from this aid. China has since worked on USAID projects and was currently commended in a speech at Tuskegee earlier this year by Samantha Power who currently runs the agency under the Biden administration. You know, yesterday I was with the administrator of U.S. Agency for International Development, Samantha Power, and I told uh, Administrator Power, you know, growing up in India, I clearly remember the USAID symbol. It's these two hands. It's from American people. And it was a different type of wheat. We were not used to that. And yet it was better than starving. So all of us ate that and then... Subsequently, the Green Revolution happened and Norman Borlaug was a kind of a celebrity hero for a lot of us who are studying agriculture and listening to his lecture turned me on and just decided at the time, wow, wow this is so cool. You know, I, I want to be like him, <laughs> change, change the world. And so the only way to do that is to get into genetics. And that's 
that's my story. So as you know, this series of our podcast, this season is about power. And we wanted to start out asking you some questions about how power works in food systems. There's a lot of ways to define power. How would you define it? Oh, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I'm not an authority on power, but I can see, I can sense when I see one. And so I would say the role certain institutions and certain actors can play have a exaggerated and undue influence on the particular sector and the course of events. And they have a, a greater bearing on how the policy is crafted and how the market is steered and how the consumers are perceived. And I would think all of these are power plays here in the area of food and agriculture sector, if that's what you're asking. And in GM debates in particular, who have been the players that you've seen who have had the most power in those conversations shaping policy or public opinion? I think it's a very much a geographical and a political issue. So I can just give you a few examples where pro-technology forces have prevailed, perhaps in, uh, in the United States or Argentina and Brazil, uh, perhaps in Australia. But the counter forces against the technology have prevailed in places like Europe, Peru, uh, maybe even in South Korea, Middle East, and Japan. And so it's not just one-sided. And there is power play and countervailing forces on either side. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes it a complex field, I'm sure, to be engaged in. We've been talking to a number of guests who sort of have pinpointed corporate concentration and corporate power as something they see as being there's too much power in corporations in shaping food systems right now. And one of the arguments that many people use against GMs are genetically modified organisms or genetic engineering is that it will further operate to concentrate corporate power because it's large corporations who can afford to develop and disperse those technologies. What would you say to that criticism? Well, you know, you can say that there is some validity to that argument, but we really need to look at it in the broader context. The power concentrates just like water finds its level. It is not unique uh, to the area of genetically modified foods. If you look at the sector of organic foods, and you, know, you could, you know, you could look at all those thousand brands. It's by, held by three or four big multinational companies with very nice, fancy mother nature and those kinds of touchy feely names, right? But they are really held by all these big multinational corporations. And it's the same with the agricultural inputs company. So it's not different from any other area, mobile phones, computers, airlines. And you see that concentration is a natural force that profit-seeking companies in an open economy system tend to consolidate as a way to maximize profits for their shareholders. But what I think we need to be wary of is to see how effective we have laws and uh, institutions that put the chucks and balance to that so that concentration of power would not go extreme against the interests of the society or the consumers. And we have a long history of antitrust laws and things against monopoly in here in the United States and in many places around the world. So we need to balance that as to how far you let these companies grow at the same time what are the ways of checks and balances that we have in place? That's interesting. One question, which might be a big question, but I'm going to pose it to you anyway, is who has the power to determine what plants and animals end up being grown and consumed? So you say that you're just a scientist, but I think scientists and research certainly plays a role in that. But there's also farmers, governments, activists. It's, it's an important question as to what we get to eat and who gets to decide. Historically, as human beings, when we moved on from the Paleolithic era and hunters and gatherers and started inventing agriculture, we literally experimented with thousands and thousands of different types of plants and a few hundreds of animals that are around us. And finally, just settled on just a handful of them, just because they were convenient to grow and they were convenient to store. And not all of them are based on nutritional factors and, and what was good for us. And so we are stuck with uh, literally five or six major crops that provide 90% of our calories. And then within that, again, uh, what is grown and what variety of that is grown 
traditionally has been before the advent of modern agriculture, I would say up until 100 years ago. We used to have uh, hundreds and hundreds of varieties being grown. Back in India, where I grew up, I can still remember hundreds of rice varieties that were grown in the place where I grew up. And even today, you can see, uh, in if you go to Mexico, uh, a lot of land races are still being grown. But as the societies move more to modern and modern agriculture, you tend to find fewer and fewer varieties being grown, primarily because of business reasons. These are the varieties that are produced by um, seed companies and they are tailored to be very productive. They're tailored to be responsive to the chemical inputs. So overall, they just give you more money for the farmer. So who decides to do what? I think eventually, end of the day, it's the farmer who decides that. And um, most farmers are entrepreneurs and uh, business people. And, and it is driven by the cost benefit analysis. Yeah, I mean, we'll move into our next question. I might come back and ask you a question about farmers' power because it's an interesting thing. Many farmers mm -hmm. feel that they don't have power within systems. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned the Green Revolution as something that you sort of grew up seeing unfold. And as you're well aware, there's debates on many sides about whether overall it was, it was a success or a failure. So on one hand, people say that it fed millions of people. And on the other, some people argue that it overall led to greater inequity, decreased biodiversity, and also had a lot of external environmental impacts. What's your feeling on the Green Revolution and why? So one could see that as a glass being half full or half empty. And I, I clearly look at that as a half full uh, because of uh, facts and reason not because of some of the twisted facts I hear from critics who don't like Green Revolution. First of all, if it is not for Green Revolution, you know, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Hundreds of millions of people like myself would have perished. And uh, Green Revolution, you know, when you look at the trajectory of wheat and then followed by corn and rice and then milk and egg, everything in the past has, has increased tremendously in a, in a very predictable manner. And that has meant that even in the, the kind of horrors that we used to see in the 60s, 4 million people died 15 years before I was born. 4 million people died for simply for lack of food in India in a great Bengal famine. These things were very recurring. And even in the mid 70s, we saw some massive starvation go on in Ethiopia. But today, such extreme uh, hunger and starvation is only prevails in countries like North Korea for a variety of political reasons. There's also an argument that the Bengal famine was not just a result of drought, but was a cause of politics and policy failure by Winston Churchill. On this issue and future ones in our discussion, we'll link the articles in our show notes and on the webpage that offer various explanations of complex topics. And so, Thanks to agricultural production backed by science all around the world, we have better food today, so much so that people can talk about it on the social media. Uh, in places like the United States, the cost of food is just 10% of our average income. And even in places like India, when I was growing up uh, with a single mother, 80% of our family money, the very meager income we had used to go for food, very minimal food. And, and today, uh, when I go back, to India or Africa, everywhere there's a much better situation. We still have about a billion people who go to bed hungry and, and we need to be doing more about it. So the point is, Green Revolution was clearly a success because if you ask demographers, everywhere there is prosperity, the number of people will come down. Go look at Russia or go look at Singapore, go look at Japan. You know, they have plenty of food to eat and, and the, the whole scenario that we were, uh, that they were predicting in the 60s, the world, the doomsday scenarios did not come true. China also acknowledges that there were problems with the Green Revolution. So that is where I think we need to have a meaningful conversation as to what are some of the excesses of Green Revolution. And with any technology and the way it is applied is what matters. And Green Revolution clearly brought indiscriminate use of uh, agrochemicals inputs in some places, and I see that rampant in India, especially the use of pesticides that are not certified and fake pesticides and our soil, water and air contamination and the whole stress on the resources that contribute to agriculture 
is a factor that we need to be worried about. And so moving forward, you know, we can debate about green revolution all the time, but, but I think a more productive way forward is to see how we can continue to improve our food production and feed the seven, eight or nine billion people that are going to be there in an equitable manner with less footprint on the ecology that supports agriculture, the air, water and the soil. And that is, I firmly believe, is driven by innovation and science and not ideology. Let's take it to a particular example here about a way to feed people more equitably and also perhaps solve a particular problem around nutrition, which is where we're going to turn to the example of the history of golden rice. Mm -hmm. If you could talk about what problem was it trying to solve, the breeding of golden rice. And you're also very welcome to nerd out on the science of the breeding process. We have an audience that craves some of the more scientific details. Certainly. Thank you. I wrote about golden rice way back in 1995 or 96 when it was simply a concept in the lab. My friend Ingo Portricus in Switzerland, I, I met him up in a meeting and he talked to me about a new research project that he had started. And I just wrote about it when before even they had results as to, wow, I thought this would be awesome. And I did not know at that time vitamin A deficiency was such a rampant problem around the world. And even 25 years since then, today, it still remains a big problem, a micronutrient deficiency that is responsible for the death of nearly a quarter of a million children around the world today and another quarter of a million children who go blind and many other diseases because uh, when you don't have vitamin A, it compromises your immunity and the children suffer from a a variety of maladies. And so there has been a a tremendous effort put together by uh, many agencies and NGOs and governments to do something about it, to educational campaign, to eat diversity of food, which is probably the most important factor. The area where the vitamin A deficiency prevails is the rice eating areas. And, you know, you cannot just add a supplement to rice. Unlike the wheat flour, we add niacin and uh, to the salt, we add iodine. You cannot do that. And so uh, because of that, the vitamin A issue has not progressed very well. This is why Swiss scientist Ingo Portricus sought to introduce the vitamin A genes directly into the rice through genetic engineering. If you look at maize, the maize corn kernel is yellow, and that's because of the pro-vitamin A that is there in it. The carrots are orange, again, because of beta-carotene, pro-vitamin A, that our body converts into vitamin A when we eat that, and that is not toxic. You can eat you know, tons of carrot like Bugs Bunny does, and nothing will happen, okay? And so what Ingo Portricus did was to simply take three genes from maize and put that into rice, through genetic engineering, through, you know, GM technology, and then produce a rice that is yellow in color for the first time. The rice, there are a lot of varieties, as you, as I told you earlier on, many of them are maintained. We have 120,000 varieties of rice maintained at Philippines in the International Rice Research Station, and not one of them has vitamin A. You see, so you cannot just take one from that collection, cross it, into all the varieties that are grown in India or Bangladesh and bring vitamin A into it. You can't do that. So it can only be done through genetic engineering and that's what was done. So it was a gene from maize put into rice and 20 years of testing and lots and lots of biosafety studies. You feed it to the rats, anything happened and then, you know, feed it to the people. Are they, are the vitamin A levels go up? Is there any downside? Are they allergic? Every kind of biosafety question was asked. And so it is a very safe technology. It's no different from throwing a couple of grains of maize into your rice pudding and eat it. You see what I mean? And so it's very similar to that. It's a genetic fortification. And uh, yet the golden rice has only been recently been approved for growing in the Philippines and other countries where it is needed, uh, like Bangladesh and India uh, and uh, parts of Africa where they do eat rice. It's still not approved, not for any safety reason or anything. It's purely for political reasons. The campaign against biotechnology in the last 20 years has been so vicious that many people, even seemingly smart people, have doubts about this. And a lot of politicians uh, just don't want to 
venture into area that would bring some controversy, however scientifically flawed it might be. There are a few strands of criticism worth addressing here, and we could easily have dedicated a whole episode to this topic. One, as China was describing, is that it legitimately takes a long time to develop these technologies. Another is that when you add beta carotene into the rice plant, it also risks changing the plant's life cycle and possibly impacting the speed of growth. These varieties need to be adapted to local conditions so the farmers can grow them. This isn't to suggest that it isn't worthwhile to develop, but it does require time and resources, which could possibly make them more expensive than other varieties for farmers to grow. I asked Shana to respond to another criticism about why not focus on a different intervention. So Greenpeace and Vandana Shiva, a long-term environmental activists, have held this kind of long-term opposition. And one of the things that they lay is they say vitamin A is available in other culturally appropriate foods and is a more efficient delivery of vitamin A per microgram, including sweet potato, leafy vegetables, mint or coriander chutney, and fruit like mango, also rich in beta carotenes. I was wondering if you could speak to that criticism first. Yes, certainly. Right. I'm very familiar with those criticisms because they're not new. They've been there right from the beginning. We, we are not against other forms of intervention. And so, you know, it's not either or, because I believe this is such a, a difficult challenge. And if it's easy, it could have been solved long ago. It's not just about money. It's not about just technology. Uh, it's about how we overlay a variety of interventions in the complex milieu of different cultures and different diets and uh, perceptions. And it's not easy to introduce a new food and different looking food either. And so I, 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 I work on sweet potato and I worked on uh, on orange flesh sweet potato, not only on breeding and genetics of that, but also in going to Africa and see how we can help popularize that. And uh, and so I am very much aware of all those interventions and how important they are. So I'm not discounting it. But at the same time, you know, it's like when you when you are trying to address HIV AIDS problem, you know, you have you have several interventions and you have several ways of your behavioral modification and your diet exercise but but then protease uh, inhibitors were the one that really nailed it and so i i personally believe that uh, golden rice might be as a, a short-term solution might help in in certain situations where uh, people may be too poor to eat a very diverse diet and that rice is all they eat and so without increasing the cost of rice, without increasing, without changing its taste or anything, if we can deliver this vital nutrient, why not? And it's really not, you know, costing a, a great deal of money. It was put together by far less than what Greenpeace has collected to, to, to wage a war against this technology. And so talk about power here, the imbalance. And it was developed by a, a scientist with a few, you know, few hundred thousand dollars budget from Rockefeller University in, in a lab in Switzerland. It was tested by public universities, international research stations, and there was the companies had really nothing to do with it. And whatever patents that they had on this, they kind of waived the rights to it. The real reason why Vandana Shiva and likes of her and Greenpeace are opposed to golden rice is not because they're worried that it is going to be a failure, but they are worried because it's going to be a success. So everything, every criticism they had against GMOs, you know, that is by multinationals, it's going to be only developed for rich farmers, it's not going to be of any benefit to the people. All of that was thrown away by development of golden rice and it became a Trojan horse, as they, they call it, but what it is, is really a straw man that they could beat upon. I frankly believe that because they were scared the golden rice is going to be successful and all the stereotypical criticisms of them against GMO would be proved wrong with this product. So they just went after this viciously, you know, dug up and burnt the crops in Philippines and destroyed the greenhouse where this was being tested in Switzerland and all kinds of things in the last 20 years. It's, it's really despicable. And I think the the notion of rice being the only food that is available for certain populations and a diverse diet isn't available is a really compelling argument. Something that I'm interested in earlier, you said that farmers had a lot of choice in choosing what crops. I think if you look at a lot of the debate around 
GM in in crops in particular, you know, where seeds can blow into a farmer's field and then they can get sued by a company or that a vast majority of GM crops at this time are linked to certain pesticides and insecticides. And it feels to many farmers like they are caught into a system that, that they don't have a choice and that they can't save their own seeds. They can't even plant in fields next to genetically modified crops. What What is your response to that? A response to that is because that, that's a mythical scenario that is not true. There's never been a single farmer who has been sued by any company ever for their, if uh, some pollen came into that. You know, this is a kind of tr- truly a bullshit story that is created by people who are opposed to this technology. And it's not true. So, you know, you should not be, you know, uh, making an arguments about so scenarios which are not true. What they have gone after, and, you know, there was a movie uh, about that came about recently about this Canadian farmer, Percy Schmeiser, was that he planted 2,000 acres uh, of his crop knowingly. Uh, and this was a contractual agreement that people have. It's like if you put a software and you don't pay for it, and, you know, the companies are going to come after that. So this is a different type of scenario in a different system in a developed country where they do have contract farming and it was a, a violation of the contracts that they went after. But there has not been a single farmer anywhere in the world that has been sued by any of these big agricultural companies for a flow of the pollen from, say, their GM crop that has gone into an organic crop. There has not been a single incidence of where organic crop has been decertified or whatever they are lost. You know, that's just a myth. This needs a little unpacking. China's fuller argument can be found in the 2018 article entitled Dissecting Claims About Monsanto Suing Farmers for Accidentally Planting Patented Seeds. The article acknowledges that while Monsanto has settled over 700 cases out of court and sued 100 farmers that use their seeds without licensing agreements, none of which they lost, they've never sued a farmer who has unknowingly, keyword here, used their seeds. They've also sued farmers for saving their own seed, which is illegal under the protection of a patent. Monsanto and the article's author defend seed patents as being essential for biotech innovation and maintaining their businesses, which invest millions of dollars in research daily. The other side argues that Monsanto have, quote, used heavy-handed investigations and ruthless prosecutions that have fundamentally changed the way many American farmers farm. Critics argue that farmers are bound into these contracts and have little choice from other suppliers, given that Monsanto, which has since merged with Bayer, is one of three companies that controls over 60% of the global seed supply. We'll include some links in our show notes that dives deeper into these perspectives. You've mentioned a couple of times about ideology versus science. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there can be a strict division between ideology and science? How do you see that play out in this debate in your life as a scientist? Yeah, it's hard, you know, because we are scientists, but we are also human beings, which we are part of our culture. We are part of our uh, forces that shape us, values and ethics. And so not all of that, some of that has had nothing to do with the science, okay? Um, if, you, if you have certain preferences for not eating a particular type of food, okay? I think we must be respectful of that. There's nothing wrong in that. Uh, but at the same time, but as a matter of science policy and public policy, if you want to impose a certain systems of growing uh, as a way to, you know, it's like the vaccine argument that we are going on for the society. Individuals may have a different preferences for a variety of reasons, but from the point of view of the society, what is good and what is not good? Are vaccine mandates good for the overall um, uh, benefit of the society? So I believe, uh, uh, and this is where I, the science, I think, prevails. Uh, ideology is where irrespective of the science, you reject certain notions, you reject eating certain types of food, you reject growing crops in certain way just because it has nothing to do with science, benefit or whatever. It is just because that's the way it should be. It's almost like a religion. It's almost like dogma, you see. And that's where my problem comes with all of this regenerative agriculture and organic agriculture, ecology, biological, all of those because they are simply dogmatic. They are not open to new ideas. They have just randomly they collected a few things, copper sulfate, it's nothing organic. It was being used in 19th century, okay, we'll use it. Okay, and there are some 
pesticides being used in organic agriculture, but they may have biological basis. So we'll use it. But although science doesn't care and nature doesn't care, the safety doesn't matter. Some of the most toxic substances known to us are, are biological substances. And science is evolving. What I know today may be wrong tomorrow if a new knowledge comes along. I may be called as an advocate for technology, but I'm really not. I'm an advocate for solutions. What's interesting is people who are maybe fall more in the, they have different assumptions about technology, also would call themselves an advocate for solutions and they have their own. That's fine. That's something that I really enjoy about this series is we, is we talk with people who see this very differently. And I respect that. I, I think the society has, you know, we, we, have, we, have, we can accommodate the diversity of views. I, in my own family, I have my children who differ with me on this and <laughs> whole range of issues. So I think as we get older, we tend to be more accommodating because we know that not, you know, the whole world cannot be seen in, in the lens of my, the prism of my eyes. So I want to move us into a few of these very live debates that are presently happening around GM and particularly uh, Sri Lanka and India. And so mm -hmm. maybe we could start with Sri Lanka, which sure. originally experimented with going 100% organic as a nation. And very recently, they ran into some issues. What do you think influenced this decision to go 100% organic and what lessons can be learned from it? Right. I don't know what really spawned uh, the president of Sri Lanka to you know suddenly one day get up in the morning and say, hey, Okay, we are going to be not using any chemical fertilizers and chemical uh, pesticides for our crop, and we are just going to go organic. And you know, which is, I think, was a, a very um, erratic uh, decision to be made in a country that is so dependent on agriculture for all their livelihood, for their exports. It's a small, beautiful country, and I've been there. And so, I think it was a, a very lopsided uh, decision, and. Later, I came to know that uh, some of the factors that may have influenced him in doing so was uh, people like Vandana Shiva and Hans Heron, who got the World Food Prize for doing some really great work on cassava in Africa. They got together and collectively they had a series of seminars, webinars, and that may have impacted the policy here. Whatever the cause for taking this decision the consequence was really disastrous. Suddenly, the rice farmers were without uh, any nutrients for their crop. And tea, and we all love tea from Sri Lanka. Tea farmers, the $3 billion, the primary source of uh, uh, foreign exchange for this small country, was gone. And so this is, overall, it was a disastrous decision. And then I think government came to its senses and reversed it. They also tried to import, uh, the, there was not enough organic fertilizer for all that they tried to import it from China and they found that was contaminated because organic manure needs to be handled very carefully and because it is you know it could have a lot of uh, harmful pathogens if it's not sterilized and it's turned that turned out to be a case either way I, it was a flawed public policy that was not done uh, with careful deliberation and all the scientists and the experts were not listened to. Even those people who very promote organic and support organic uh, farming in Sri Lanka have said that uh, the way this was done was a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what happened. So much so that Sri Lankan government last week had to dish out $200 million to the rice farmers. Then food prices went up by 21%. And uh, overall, I think many other countries should now look at Sri Lanka and see what not to do. In that way, it was, it was a silver lining in the cloud. Is There's a good lesson to be learned here. This program was rolled out very quickly. The Sri Lankan president campaigned in 2019 on transitioning to organic over the next 10 years. And within two years of him taking office, he declared a full and quick transition to organic. In addition to the consequences of what China talked about, this also caused a self-sufficient rice-producing nation to import $450 million U.S. million worth of rice. It's interesting to think whether these decisions and debates are driven by ideology, politics, science, or some combination of them. So I asked Chana about another example that has had demonstrably better results. 
Another example that people in the agroecology camp turn to often is Andhra Pradesh, the state of India that's transitioning towards yeah. a chemical three low input, quote, natural farming practices. Yes. But this has also been happening over decades. It wasn't an overnight decision. They tried to build a democratic consensus around this agroecological right. approach, and they experimented with many field trials and tested yields and the impacts on soil to demonstrate its efficacy before scaling it out. How do you think about this plan and this program? Or do you think they're also being overly dogmatic about not using synthetic fertilizers and pesticides? The Andhra Pradesh case that you're talking about, it's a state in India where they have come across and say that eventually they want to go into what they term as a zero budget natural farming. And Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, also spoke at an event a couple of months ago and said that that is one way that he wants India to go. And the scientists uh, in India were aghast when he heard Modi say that. We are familiar with what's going on in Andhra Pradesh. And this is one camp where both organic and conventional agricultures are together because <laughs> the, 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 this crazy zero budget natural farming concept came up with an idea of one person in India. Okay. His name is Suresh Palekar. He's, he's from Maharashtra. And he has been a lone proponent of this and somehow got the traction. And a few politicians thought, wow, this was a great idea. Why not? So it essentially boils down to this. They are against organic farming. They are against organic inputs. Okay. And they're against any conventional inputs, any chemical input. And they believe the whole agriculture can be practiced uh, and the nutrients can be provided with cow manure alone. And all the pest control can be done with cow urine. Okay. So this is like a little crazy, crazy part of agriculture that, you know, talk about organic going overnight is a disaster. And this is going to be a super disaster for the country because there's very no scientific evidence that if you just grow, you know, treat the seeds in, in the cow urine, they're going to be resistant to all the diseases and pests. And then where are you going to get all the cow manure to feed 1.5 billion people in India? You know, if you are against, uh, you know, industrial type animal farming. And so uh, th there may be a specific situation where this zero budget natural farming with no uh, external inputs of whatsoever might work under certain scenarios in a niche uh, environment. And so be it just like, you know, we have all kinds of agricultural uh, types, but as a policy for a country that uh, occupies 20% of the humanity, on a 6% of the arable land with a multitude of problems, poverty and lack of infrastructure and everything. And then you want to impose something crazy, uh, cockamamie idea like this is a recipe for super disaster. Interesting to hear China discuss Andhra Pradesh like this, as we've had past guests who have praised it as a model for low input agriculture that can be scaled out to other contexts. As stated in my question, there have been lots of experiments to understand the efficacy of the techniques practiced in zero budget natural farming. Some of the techniques include using cow dung and urine for, quote, microbial seed coating and enhancing the soil microbiome through an inoculum. Cover cropping and crop rotation are also practiced and tested through farmer to farmer dissemination. Chan acknowledges this could be practiced in some contexts, but emphasizes it should not be looked at as a model to scale out at a national level. One thing that I wanted to jump in with is you've talked about food prices a lot as sort of an argument against organic or a lower input Absolutely. agricultural prices, which is something that comes up a lot in, in discussions about food system transformation. And people talk about food prices are low because we're not accounting for the impacts of larger environmental and social impacts of quote unquote cheap food. And that we should actually be looking more at things like guaranteed basic income that would give people more money to buy food, which should be more expensive. So where would you weigh in on that debate? Yeah, I, I mean, again, that's that goes beyond my expertise in terms of the fixed income. Those are really important, you know, some really new radical new ideas that are coming. And some of them do have merit in it. But that has to do with the, the gross economic inequity that we have in this society here in the United States and in and, and all over the world. I come from India and we're, it's really a, an incredible as to how there's, there's, there's so many billionaires and yet we have hundreds of millions of people who can't even, uh, you know, one meal to eat. 
again as an agricultural scientist pondering about these things what is important is you know we need to keep food affordable okay it's very important even a small even a, a 10% increase in the is in the cost of rice in a place like bangladesh where rice is everything can be a catastrophic increase the inflation can have a catastrophic consequences okay it's okay in the united states uh, you know most people we've had what 6% increase in just last year alone i know they kind of you know probably crumble about it when they see the price of bread or egg going up but it's not a big deal right even if the food price is double it can be cushioned and it can be absorbed what i'm talking about is 80% of the people in the united states this, the, the poor here are still going to suffer all of that uh, is a, a war on the poor yeah food is where it really hurts we asked chana to share his view on what approaches he would advocate for instead of organic farming to reduce the use of agricultural chemicals we do have solutions for many of the same problems genetic engineering especially the newer technology of gene editing which does not entail transfer of foreign genes it's just, a, just like mutation breeding that we all have been doing for 100 years now is tweaking uh, your potato or tomato and rice whatever you're growing with some enzymes to some often times including even golden rice to produce the same trait as we had done with gene modification which is so much opposed but in this gene editing there is really not going to be any foreign gene and where yet we can bring about these changes we can make our crops more resilient to climate change we can make them more uh, nutritional uh, less toxins like cyanide in cassava which are all serious problems and we have this opportunity along with the multitude of other technologies like sensors and many new artificial intelligence machine learning all of them if we use creatively we would be able to improve the food production with less chemical inputs and make them more nutritional and definitely more resilient to the vagaries of climate change we don't have to go back with the primitive technologies and primitive ideas to to move forward we've heard you say in other interviews before that the your farm to fork strategy is going backwards it's not science based it's driven by emotions and ideologies and we've talked throughout this conversation about some of the these ideologies and your concerns about them i'd like to ask you what do you think a more science driven policy would look like and then also what are your larger future aspirations for the food system right i think um, you know again going science based is a trust in finding solutions through science integrated pest management is one of the most uh, important ways of finding a solution for the pest and disease problems and then using uh, novel uh, technologies it's not just genetic modification but you know use of genomics which does not involve any uh, genetic engineering but using the knowledge of the, the the biology of the plant to help us develop better varieties is, is something that is now really picked up a lot of speed everywhere and in some cases we may need to tweak it a little bit and again knowledge of genetics would help in gene editing but beyond that and you know i mean that's again a very techno focused on one one area in in development of plant varieties but just only that is one part of the big puzzle of what is agriculture i do believe we will be moving forward in a way that we would keep in mind the diversity the biodiversity on the farm and we can not only maintain but perhaps even the increase by lowering of the the chemical inputs so i am a, a kind of techno optimist in many ways because i do recognize the negative impact say fertilizers have had and uh, we know in the gulf of mexico here how barren it is and and also in places like india is just indiscriminate use of uh, by the some many times illiterate farmers but on the other hand Uh, combined with education and a ma- combined with meaningful policies but some scientific innovation too you know there is some really bright uh, research that's showing we may be able to fix nitrogen in crops like corn rice and wheat they don't fix nitrogen traditionally unlike soybean or groundnut and some of the other legumes so i do believe in 10 or 15 20 years time uh, nitrogen fertilizers are going to be history 
we are going to be having crops that can take 70% of our air is nitrogen. You know, we should, it's just that our crops don't know how to get the nitrogen from the air and fix it. And it's not just the crop, but it's also the microbiome. We are much better at it today than even five years ago in screening millions of microorganisms that are there in the earth and pick up some that are able to help corn bring nitrogen into that and rejigger the corn genome in such a way that even a very small amount of fertilizers with potassium and other nutrients that are needed may, may be necessary so that there may not be fertilizer runoffs. And, and so I, I think Thinking creatively uh, along these lines uh, with innovation, the same way out of the current mess that we are in with the climate change, uh, innovating through green technologies, whether it's batteries or fusion or whatever that's going to come, is our only way forward to make the, the internal combustion engine obsolete. And that's the way I, I do believe that we will be moving forward with our food and farming systems. Something we're trying to explore with Table and with this podcast is how people come to such different conclusions about food system solutions. So how you can look at the same issue, like you talked about runoff in the Gulf of Mexico. And you mentioned someone like Hans Heron, who looks at the food system and like you is a smart, thoughtful person and comes to radically different conclusions about what needs to happen. Why do you think this happens? Why are you and someone else who's also very thoughtful um, and respected, why are you coming to such different conclusions? I, I don't know why. But what I think what we need to do is when you talk to anybody and they say, if mine is the only way that is correct and others are all idiots and they are wrong, then you you got to have a red flag in your mind. But, and so when you come up with a system and say, all others are evil and they need to be stopped and I can progress and this is the only way forward. And then that's bullshit. And so all of them have a little place in the society and so be it. But when you try to wage a war against my technology, okay, we're coming up with all kinds of spurious reasons and then coming up with deceptive practices. Look at this. You know, you talk about power. You know, the organic is $100 billion industry here. And you talk about power. You have the non-GMO, which is a, which is the most deceptive uh, label out there in the American supermarkets today. You have non-GMO salts. You have non-GMO lemon juice. You have non-GMO on everything. And so the consumers are paying for this stupid label for which the alternative doesn't exist. Okay, so this is just fear marketing. And so let... Let all the solutions play it out in the um, in the marketplace of ideas, in the marketplace of products, and let the superior solution and the superior products win. But if you try to play it out in a really uh, you know a, a nasty manner by twisting the the perception of the public, but by fear marketing, oh, you buy my product. This is the only way that is going to save the earth, the mother earth. You know, and you look at the supplement industry, for instance, there's very little scientific basis for a lot of that. And it's literally runs to billions and billions of dollars and just all based on capitalizing on public ignorance. One final question that we wanted to ask you, which is really focused on the vision you've been articulating and sort of our main theme about power. How does power need to be shifted in order to achieve this vision talking about false advertising, all of the things you sort of brought in, how, how would things need to shift in order to, for your food system vision to be realized? Well, I think power needs to be democratized. The power needs to go to the people and the people need to have, be able to make decisions based on facts, not fear. Uh, they need to have uh, the choices that need to be made. They need to be guided based on uh, information and reason. I think that is the only way out in a way. So where the power gets concentrated, if individuals, corporations tend to have a certain monopoly over the delivery of those products and have undue influence on how they can provide this information. And right now, the way I see it is, you know, there is a lot of misguided information uh, that is coming out from the purveyors of many of these products and everybody who wants to have a share in the marketplace are not playing it truthfully. 
Jana Prakash, thank you so much for speaking with us. This was my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't ask you. Uh, we didn't ask you easy questions, and we really appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. And that wraps another episode of Feed, the Food Systems Podcast. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed the show, the best way you could support us is by sharing your favorite episodes with your friends and colleagues and rating or reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is that you listen. If you'd like to learn more about Chana Prakash or the different GM debates, there's a lot of resources connected to this episode on our show notes and on our webpage. And if you'd like to chat about the episode, leave us a message on the Table Community platform, community.tabledebates.org. Table is a collaboration between the University of Oxford, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and Wageningen University. You can stay up to date with Table's activities by subscribing to our newsletter fodder or following us on social media. We're at Table Debates on all the platforms. This episode was edited by Matthew Kessler with valuable feedback from the extended Table community. Talk to you in two weeks.